Welcome back everyone, and today we'll be synthesizing Quinlan by the Scrout Method. So I'm going to be using the, four, uh, the ferrous sulfate boric acid modification. So here's 7 grams of iron to sulfate heptahydrate, 18.5 milliliters of aniline, 12.3 milliliters of mononitrobenzene, and we're going to combine it all into a 500 milliliter flask and weigh out 12.5 grams of boric acid, and add that into 60 milliliters of glycerin. We need it to dissolve. I mean, you probably don't have to, but that's what the paper called for. Uh, I'm using a mixture of paper, so I'll link them all in the description, of course. So after it's all dissolved, we're going to set that aside and put our uh, flask back on. And we're going to combine the glycerin and all that stuff. So the glycerin's actually, um, it's both a solvent and a reactant, which is pretty interesting. And now we're going to add 35 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid. It's going to form aniline sulfate, so it's going to clunk. Uh, clump up really. So a stir bar is really useless for this. In fact, I won't recommend a stir bar because you're going to be cooking this thing for at least 9 to 20 hours at 200 Celsius. So uh, <laughs> yeah. So the iron 2 sulfate is actually pretty interesting. It acts sort of as an inhibitor. It slows down the reaction. Normal scrap synthesis is quite exothermic and it might run away making a tar fountain. So uh, yeah, that's what that's for. And the boric acid I, it increases the yield. I don't know how, but it just does something. So again, reflux is for 9 to 20 hours. I did for 6 hours actually because I didn't have enough time. But that seemed to work fine anyways. I got a 47% yield, which is acceptable considering I shortened the amount of reflux time. So, um, yeah, now starts the simmering process, I guess. While that's bubbling away, let's take an actual look at the reaction mechanism. Glycerin undergoes dehydration by sulfuric acid to use acrolein, which is protonated to 1 hydroxyprop 2 ene one helium. A lone pair on the nitrogen of aniline can attack double bond, which is able to transfer to the carbocation, forming N2E3 hydroxyprop 2 ene one aninium, which then, through a series of electron transfers, will yield 1 hydroxy 3 phenylamino propan one helium. The benzylic carbon is able to donate an electron pair to the carbocation, cyclizing the chain to form 4 hydroxy 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, A5 hydroquinoline 5 helium, with removal of a proton. With a double bond formation and an elimination of another proton, we get 1, 2, 3, 4 tetrahydroquinoline 4 all, and another double bond formation with elimination of water will yield 1, 2 hydroquinoline, which under the influence of nitrobenzene yields our final product, quinoline. During the reflux, you're able to observe water reflux in the flask, that is from the acrolein synthesis. Now, the reason why this makes so much tar is because it uses glycerin to form the acrolein in situ, which is quite a messy reaction. Would be more desirable to use pure acrolein, but, well, <laughs> who has pure acrolein? Uh, I'm gonna have to make some, aren't I? <laughs> Well, I'm probably going to anyways. So now we're going to steam distill out any remaining nitrobenzene. So I'm still going to add water and steam distill until the distillate is clear and no longer smells of almonds. So you can see here our nitrobenzene is distilling over. And in fact, I'm going to recycle this nitrobenzene uh, into the bottle again because it's perfectly fine and reusable. A Discord member commented, soy sauce distillation. It does look like soy sauce. Okay, so I've added all the water in the funnel and let it boil down a little more, and you can see we're no longer getting a milky colored distillate, we're getting a clear liquid. It has a slight smell of nitrobenzene, but oh well. Now we need 125 milliliters of a 60% sodium hydroxide solution. So I'll prepare that by dissolving 70 gram, uh, 75 grams of sodium hydroxide into water until it reaches 120 milliliters. Frick it, we use a spoon. Okay, I would use a pipette, but my plastic pipettes will melt from this hot solution because it's hot. So I'm going to add a tiny bit in and see how violent the reaction is. Because this is still quite acidic. Ooh yeah, she mad. Okay, we're going to let this thing cool down to room temperature. Okay, so it's been cooling in the ice bath. Uh, should be cold enough now, probably. <laughs> Ooh, still violent. So again, cool this down. You know what? I'll put an ice cube in. We're gonna steam distill it anyway, so it doesn't matter if some water is in our sodium hydroxide solution. Okay, let's try it now. I am impatient, so yeah, of course. Okay, that's not too bad. I also refuse to heat hot caustic in my uh, flasks unless it's one that's already been etched. So I'm going to use one that's already etched. The etched one, don't want to ruin the good ones. Maybe I already did by doing that. 
Uh, probably gonna use a funnel. I don't want to get in joints. It'll seize them. Huh, where's my funnel? The plastic's gonna reek after this, but I can always just make another funnel. <laughs> so we'll just pour this in. The tar seems to dissolve in acetone, by the way, so that's how you're gonna clean your glassware with some hot acetone. If this is cold, I'll heat it up later on a steam bath. And I'm gonna steam this through with the ice bath water because we're going to conserve water today. So that's heating up. We're gonna recycle our nitro benzene. You can see there's quite a lot in there. Not a lot, but I mean, it's still some. And nitro is very annoying to dispose of, so I might as well recycle it into fresh nitro benzene to use. And I will not be distilling it because it's already been steam distilled and that should be good enough purity for most of my reactions that I plan to use it for. So I'm simply just going to extract with some dichloromethane. I almost forgot the boiling chips. We do not want a tar fountain. So, sploosh. There we go. Okay, so this will go in here. Now, before any of you safety nerds get angry at me in the comments for free-handing nitrobenzene without gloves, uh, from what I can tell, it's not really that toxic. I mean, it, yeah, it is toxic, but like, last time I handled it, I got it on my hands, and um, I'm fine after I just wash it off with some soap and water. It's not like crazy toxic like cyanide. The, the things I will not work without gloves, or just at all, is cyanide. And also like lead and mercury and stuff that accumulates. Because dichloromethane, if you get it on yourself, ah yeah, it hurts, it makes your skin burn, but I mean, it's not going to do much in the long run unless you prick yourself a needle of it. Okay, so we're going to take off the dichloromethane, nitrobenzene into a flask, and I'll dry it of course. It has started to boil, only after I agitated the flask, which is a bit weird. Okay, it's boiling now and it does not seem to be foaming, so that's a good sign. You can see our distillate is in fact cloudy, which means we're distilling over our quinoline. Okay, so now I've got the water addition rate roughly matching the distillation rate. Uh, it's roughly. If I wanted to, I could just use my um, precision addition funnel. This thing has a needle valve, so I can get a very precise drip rate, but uh, for one, it, it has a sidearm, which means I have to stop at the top of it, which, while well, this one has a valve on there, so I can shut that off. And second, I'm just lazy and it would not fit in the fume hood, it's a bit large. It's gotten worse now, so I'm gonna try adding the magic ingredient, molecular sieves, and uh, the idea is it helps nucleate the thing. If I shake it, then it no longer friggin' sieves. There. Boiling much better. So now we get some tar in our. Uh, fine, I'll remove heating. Put our new flask, I guess. Let's see if we can see why it bumps. Probably not, because it's cooling down now, but... Oh, we're getting tar in our product now. Let's try transferring it into a new flask. Maybe that'll solve it. So, move this off heat. Ooh, hot, 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 hot. Drink. <laughs> Ooh, still getting burned somewhere. There we go. For whatever god awful reasons, the side just stopped bumping again. Turning it out heat it only made it more violent. There we go. Heating's on max, of course. So we're just going to spill this and we're going to place this over here instead. So now what we're doing is actually steam distilling the quinoline over, the crude quinoline, and also some aniline over, and uh, we have made a grimace shake. So now we're going to take 15 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric gas and dilute it with water to 50-50, and we're going to combine it with our distillate to uh, convert any free amines such as quinoline or aniline into their sulfate salts. And this will be for our upcoming step, which is diazination. We're going to add in sodium nitrite. So here's some, it doesn't, uh, you just add it until um, testing the uh, solution with iodine starch, uh, iodide starch reads positive. So what we're doing here is um, aniline is able to undergo a uh, diazination to form a diazonium salt. 
and the lysonium salt can then hydrolyze in water to form phen uh, phenol. Which phenol, in our next step, we're going to basify the solution heavily, so any phenol is going to convert into phenoxide, which is not volatile. As you can see, this reaction foams a lot and also makes nitrogen dioxide, so do this on your fume hood. And um, you only need approximately uh, one gram of uh, nitrite for the scale. And I'm just going to leave it stirring for a few hours, and uh, yeah, that's really it for this process. <laughs> Very simple. And in the meantime, I'm going to filter off my dichloromethane nitrobenzene and distill the dichloromethane off. And uh, yes, I do use the Dean Stark for distillation, they're so superior. And uh, I'm just getting the last bit of dichloromethane vapor out of this flask by uh, <laughs> leaning it over. Again, under a few mood, don't, ma don't worry. And here's our nitrobenzene, which I should have let it cool, but there, we got it into a bottle. And here is our mixture after one hour, and I basified it with a bunch of sodium hydroxide, arbitrary amount, and steam distilled it once again. And now we have this weird color-changing soy sauce. And here's our distillate, which contains our yellow quinoline. Should be clear, but eh, it's slightly yellow, that doesn't matter. Now, you should, you could extract aqueous layer with some ether or dichloromethane and distill all that off and get your quinoline that way, but I found simply letting it sit overnight condenses all of the um, uh, quinoline that's in suspension into one big droplet, so I just separate that out. And I decided to measure yield, but uh, the scale, uh, it broke, uh, not, like, for some reason, I don't know why, so I smashed it with a hammer because I got mad at it, but I got 47% yield, uh, approximately. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much the end of this video. I don't know what I'm going to do with the quinoline. I'm probably going to uh, make phenanthralin, which can be used in microwave-assisted uh, decarboxylations of aromatic uh, carbox uh, carboxylic acids, such as benzoic acid to benzene. So I want to try that. I want to do microwave chemistry. I have a lab microwave, so I'm going to use it. Uh, although I'm going to modify the lab microwave, and there's going to be a video about that as well. But, yeah, that's pretty much the end of this video. And, um, yeah, see you guys next time. And, uh, don't worry, I am working on a lot of other projects right now. Cubane, um, <laughs> may have done something a bit stupid there. But, uh, yeah. And also, of course, uh, high, uh electronics shenaniganery. I've been fixing up the Geiger counter a bit more by replacing stuff in it, but now I've ran into a stupid little self-oscillating issue where it keeps ringing up for no reason. And, um, yeah, that, that's it, I guess. <laughs> See you guys in the next episode. Yeah. Bye. Yeah.